Okay. We should be live, folks. Um, welcome. You're watching the BrizzJS live stream. And tonight we have some exciting talks uh, by Ashley Davis, Camilo. Uh, I'm going to butcher your last name, sorry. Uh, but Butrago. <laughs> um, Aaron Powell. Uh, and uh, you're here with me, Kevin Van Der Beeken. Um, I'm going to crack straight into today's uh, preamble and go through the, uh, the the talks that we have today and uh, some details about BrizzJS. Uh, let me just share screen. Cool. So uh, you should be seeing starting soon. Please stand by. Let's go to the next one. Uh, cool. As with uh, our live online streamed events, uh, while we're all in this uh, COVID situation, uh, we're not meeting in person in uh, the order in general uh, spaces with our 120-ish uh, people at once all packed in. Uh, we're, we're doing this from home. So that doesn't mean, however, that you can't go and uh, interact and ask questions and uh, do those meaningful things. We've got our, uh, our, um, our chat options on YouTube as well as the ability to answer questions on Slido. Uh, hopefully that links to the correct one. Uh, Slido.com, uh, you can enter that key number there and you can uh, do this from your mobile device or your desktop computer, wherever you're watching. Uh, you can uh, go and flip to that and uh, you can actually um, po uh, put up some, uh, some questions about uh, something that you've heard the presenters say and you want some more information. At the end of their talks, we slide, uh, go back to that list and I go and read those questions out and ask everyone about those things. Um, so that's how we're going to do those interactive bits and pieces. Um, any questions, anything else? Uh, I'll be watching the BrizzJS uh, stream on uh, YouTube. Uh, looking at the chat, and uh, then we're going to go through and uh, have a look at all that. Cool. So uh, at our uh, in-person events, we always did the acknowledgement of country this year. Um, so while we're all distributed, I think it's really important that you can do your own research and find out where uh, the traditional owners of, uh, of where you are right now um, are and uh, pay respects to elders past and present. Uh, it's really useful actually for tracking purposes and to get the YouTube link, uh, direct link, um, to be able to uh, RSVP on our YouTube page. And that way we know um, how many folks are getting our messages um, and seeing that we're hosting these online events. So thank you for doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay, so code of conduct. Uh, even though we're in an online environment now, uh, this is uh, just as important. So we have a code of conduct. You can find it at that link. And uh, we have to make sure that this is a harassment free experience for everyone. Uh, so that includes all our chat feeds and any of the question feeds and anything like that. So uh, do abide by that. We do expect everyone to understand that. I always say this, can't say it enough. Um, we really need more presenters. So anytime you, uh, you might have an interesting thing that you've come up with or um, You've had a few people um, raise some interesting questions. You think you can contribute a talk? Um, it would be fantastic if you could reach out to us, um, or you can just post one directly on our GitHub. Um, you can also go and uh, check out the BrizzJS page, and there's a present link that will um, sort of forward you through to GitHub with a performer box that you can go in. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a frog in my throat. <coughs> Excuse me again. Ah, oh, the dangers of live streaming. Okay, I'm back. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can go through and use that then pre-filled out box and you can uh, then uh, enter in the required information. All we really wanna know is who you are, um, a title for your talk and uh, what you're about to present. Uh, we really appreciate any of the submissions. Um, there's, there's no criteria process there. Uh, as long as it's something about JS or the web tech sphere, we can do yeah. <coughs> Sorry, just recovering for a cold for anyone who was really interested in that. Um, cool. So uh, the this is what it would look like on GitHub. That's uh, our presence for the meetup issues, and uh, we're uh, you would we use that then for scheduling, and we we mark that with various labels so we can see the length and and, uh, and things for the for the uh, audience for that month. Uh, we have plenty of different socials, so hopefully you've been following us there. 
if you're on Facebook, there's one there. Uh, our most active one is on Twitter. And uh, we've got our YouTube channel, as you know, and you are watching from right now. There's also BrizJazz.org, which is a bit of a central linking place for everything. And uh, we have a jobs page on brizjs.org. So you can uh, go there and it uh, consolidates all the different job posts that we have uh, in our GitHub, GitHub issues. So it pulls together all the issues that have been marked as for jobs. Um, so you'll feel free to look at that. And if you've got a job to contribute, uh, please do so via that as well. Um, that'll be put up in a timely manner as soon as it gets tagged. Okay, so for uh, community events, uh, there's uh, something coming up in September 2020, which is Web Directions Code Remote. Uh, so Code Remote is obviously the remote version of uh, Web Directions Code that you might be familiar with before. Uh, so we, uh, I, I mentioned on our email blast about tonight's event that there is actually a, uh, that, that there was like an early bird call. Um, you have unfortunately missed that, that ended on Friday. Um, but I think the, the uh, ticket uh, price is still very uh, competitive. And if you're experiencing some financial hardship, you can actually uh, apply for a pay what you can uh, ticket there as well. Uh, ooh, I should probably say when that is. Uh, that says in Southeast Asia Pacific time. Actually, that's on there as well. Hopefully you can still read that. That's September 3rd, 10th, 17th, 24th. Uh, that's on Pacific time. Australia East Coast, that's the one that we want. September 4th, 11th, 18th, and 25th. Uh, that says it's between 11 a.m. and 2.30 a.m., 2.30 p.m. Um, sorry about that. I should have actually prepared that in advance and had some slide notes. Um, cool, so um, we've got a bunch of sponsors that we've been able to uh, carry us forward as BrizJS. Uh, one of those is where I work, Console Connect. Um, excuse me for a second. I'm back, uh, I had to close the door. Uh, okay, so we've at Console Connect, I've been working there forever and uh, it's, a, it's a great place. Uh, actually, PCCW Global is the parent company that we'll work for. Console Connect's a great product to be able to do network and cloud, cloud automation. Um, so uh, they've been looking for uh, new candidates, uh, different jobs there. So if you're interested in any of those positions or anything at all, um, I can forward you through to um, the, uh, the, the managers uh, over there as well. And uh, they can let you know if there's anything available. Um, I think those positions there actually may be filled. I'll have to go and check with everyone on that one there as well. But thank you very much for contributing that and getting in touch about those positions as well. Um, they've been sponsoring our Zoom Pro. So thanks very much for making this happen. Uh, Wallaby JS has been great. Uh, well, the what, folks at Wallaby, sorry, what, they produce Wallaby JS and Quokka JS. Uh, they've been great to be able to um, provide us uh, with a giveaway. Uh, so, for answering a, uh, a question uh, about one of our talks tonight via the Slido, um, I'm going to be um, giving away a license to, uh, I believe it's Wallaby JS tonight. I'll, uh, I'll let you know midway. Um, but uh, we have some licenses to give away. Uh, so, please. Um, pay attention and answer that question. That would be great. So tonight we've got WebAssembly, your browser sandbox, and that's uh, by Aaron Powell. Uh, we're going to go straight into when to reinvent the wheel, building your own query language in TypeScript by Ashley Davis. And then we're going to go into Gatsby and Strappy by Camilo. And uh, that will be another great half an hour block talk. So thank you very much everyone for submitting some, uh, some great talks tonight. And uh, then we'll we'll wrap out for no, for tonight and, and do some online polls and get some feedback from everyone. Okay, so enough sharing there. I'm going to uh, go straight into our first speaker. There, uh, I'm going to ask Aaron to unmute yourself, please. I suppose I can do that. Thank you. Take it away, mate. All right, well, thanks uh, for having me back uh, to speak at your lovely meetup. Um, one day I do hope to be allowed to leave the uh, glorious state of New South Wales, but uh, again, we are getting tighter and tighter restrictions. But one day I'll, uh, we'll, we'll get, get back to in person. I'd love to come up actually uh, present it or at least attend in person. Um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about WebAssembly. And this is uh, something that, that 
I am by no means an expert in. It's something that I've been exploring and trying to understand. And this is sort of what I have taken away from what I've been doing with WebAssembly. But first off, who am I? Uh, I'm My name's Aaron Powell. I work at Microsoft as a cloud developer advocate, so part of the developer relations team. Uh, I've been building stuff on the web for around 15 or so years now. Uh, I've done pretty much every JavaScript framework under the sun. And I remember when we didn't use JavaScript frameworks and when Netscape was a browser that we still targeted and not made fun of. Uh, you can find me online at a variety of locations. Um, that's my website and uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I will not apologize because Twitter is what it is and you know what you're getting in for if you follow uh, random people on Twitter. So, but. You're not here to just hear me talk about me. You're here to learn about WebAssembly. So let's get started with that. Welcome to WebAssembly. This is a WebAssembly application. Uh, this is written in the WebAssembly text format language. Uh, so WebAssembly text, uh, uh, yeah, that's um, WebAssembly text format. That's what it is. Uh, and let's just break down this application here. So we're starting off with a module. And inside of that module, we're importing a function from an object called console. And the function's name is log. Uh, that function is going to, uh, I'm just aliasing it with dollars log inside of the um, uh, running um, code base. Uh, so the, the WebAssembly uh, application as dollars log. And it's going to take two arguments. They're both in 32, so I32. Uh, then the next thing that we're going to do is import some memory for the WebAssembly application. Uh, this is coming off an object called JS and a property called uh, mem. And it's going to be a one uh, page of memory, which is 64 kilobits. We're then going to put some data into that memory. Uh, it's a 32-bit um, uh, int uh, constant of zero. So we're starting at the zero pointer of the memory. And then we're going to push in a data chunk that is a capital H and a lowercase i. We're then going to create a function with inside of this uh, WebAssembly application called write high. Uh, then the first thing that that function is going to do is pop a variable onto the stack and in 32 value of zero. And then it's going to pop a second in 32 value called two onto the stack. And then it's going to call the dollars log function. So that, that function that we passed into our application uh, by calling that function, it's going to then pop those two arguments off the stack, uh, passing those arguments to the function. And that will get called by the, uh, that will get, you know, uh, handled by the caller because it's passed in that function. So in JavaScript, um, we create our memory. Uh, so this is using the WebAssembly API in JavaScript. We're creating a new memory instance with an initial page size of one kilobit. Uh, sorry, uh, one page size, 64 kilobits. Uh, we're then creating a function called log. It's going to have an offset and length. Uh, this is JavaScript, so it's inherently untyped, but we're going to assume that they're going to be numbers, um, uh, uh, in 32s in particular. Inside of that function, we're using a uint8 array. Uh, we're going to take the memory, which is actually really just like a buffer, um, uh, like a, an array buffer uh, in JavaScript. Uh, we're going to pass that to the uint8 array. We're then going to pass the offset and length. So what part of that memory buffer do we want to extract? Uh, we're then going to take out those bytes, decode them as a UTF-8 string using the, um, the JavaScript text decoder, and then we're going to call console.log. Finally, we're going to create an object to pass through to our WebAssembly um, application as we start it. So it's got a property called console with a value log, and it's got another um, property called JS, and it's going to have a uh, property of itself called mem. We're then going to use WebAssembly. We're going to instantiate streaming where we're going to pass it something that is returning a promise and that promise is going to resolve out a WebAssembly binary, in this case, fetch. It's going to download the WASM binary from um, uh, our endpoint. Uh, we're passing through that object, uh, import object as the, um, the, the starting thing. This is going to return our um, uh, a promise, which when completed, we'll have an object that represents the current instance of WebAssembly, any exports that it have, in this case, that write high function. And if everything goes correctly, we have written the characters capital H, lowercase i, to the JavaScript console. And now if you're looking at this and going, what, what, if, what did I sign up for today? Um, yeah, I, I fully appreciate it. This is probably quite confusing because we have dived into, oh, I have a spider crawling down my monitor. Uh, let's get rid of that. Uh, this is looking probably fairly confusing uh, because we've dived straight into WebAssembly and not really set up any of the fundamentals or, or kind of understanding of how we got here and like why this is maybe of relevance or interest or anything like that. So let's take a step back and start at the beginning. Not, no, not go back to that assembly store to code that we were looking at, but let's start talking about you know, what is WebAssembly and why is it kind of relevant? 
So WebAssembly really started as an evolution of Asm.js. So Asm.js was a project that Mozilla started in, I think it was around about 2013, where they wanted to work out how to make really highly optimized JavaScript applications. Now, JavaScript is getting faster and faster, and we know that, but there's a point that JavaScript can't get much faster because of things about the language that we just can't fundamentally change. The fact that it's a pseudo dynamic language, the fact that uh, we don't really have a strong type system, you know, those sorts of things make it really difficult to do highly optimized applications. I think about trying to build a game engine to run like 3D graphics in JavaScript. It's really difficult just because of the nature of JavaScript. So instead, Asm.js was proposed as a strict subset of the JavaScript language. It didn't have all of the things that we tend to love about JavaScript, the, the loose typing, the dynamic nature of it and stuff like that. And instead, uh, we, we kind of compile out those so that you don't use them. And by not using them and knowing that the application doesn't use them, the browsers could then optimize for it, or more accurately, the JavaScript runtimes could optimize for it. So then they could not have to worry about things like just-in-time compilation and um, trying to, to deal with the idiosyncrasies of the JavaScript language and just run things as fast as they could. So this wasn't really designed as something you would write. Asm.js was a compilation target for things like C and C++ using the LLVM compilers. So then WebAssembly kind of evolved out of that as an idea of, well, it, it was actually quite... Uh, appealing to a lot of uh, applications uh, in industry. I remember one of the first demos I saw of Asm.js was running the Unreal Engine in the browser, which is kind of crazy. Like it was like fully rendering 3D graphics in the browser. And this is like in 2013. Like that was, that was a big deal back then. Uh, so the idea of actually let's remove JavaScript kind of fully from it and create a stack-based virtual machine to run inside of the JavaScript runtime. And this is then going to run compiled binary. So not something that you uh, that is still actually fundamentally JavaScript that you're interpreting. This is something that is compiled. So by being a compiled language and compiled as an application format, we understand a lot more about how it's uh, done and it is able to be optimized for a lot more efficiently. And we'll also make it a really highly memory constrained environment because uh, particularly these um, complex applications like um, I'll, I'll go back to gaming again. Being able to control the, the way the memory is managed from a, a game engine is really, really powerful. Um, so by giving, but by giving the control back to the host of this virtual machine, we can control the way that memory is managed and the memory that's made available for it. Avoid things like memory leaks and you know crashing browsers, at least crashing browsers as easily and as efficiently as we can do today. But WebAssembly only really supports a very strict set of data types. In fact, it only really supports numbers. Ints and floats at 32 and 64 bit precision. Like that's actually the data structures that we've got with inside of WebAssembly. Now, things like strings are actually just numbers represented as like really complex byte arrays. So it, you can represent more complex things, but fundamentally they're numbers. Everything's a number. And the idea is, again, WebAssembly is not meant to be something that you would write yourself. So that WebAssembly text format, like that, that language I showed at the start, like you don't write that. I mean, you can. If you really want to write assembly code, you can. Uh, instead, it's a compilation target for things like C and C++ and stuff like that. Now, again, you're probably thinking, I've come to a web developer talk and I don't think that I've ever heard someone say, your web page needs more C++ in it. Uh, I, I never had the joy of working with things like CGI bin. Uh, I've, I've been in the industry for a while, but I never actually did web servers that were written purely in like C or C++ or uh, like Delphi and things like that. Like I, I came in at classic ASP. So I used VB script. Like that was one of my first uh, experiences in web programming. So yeah, this idea of like really low level programming, like that, like C um, and those sort of languages in the browser, that's doesn't sound super appealing done enough C++ to know that I probably don't want to write that for the browser. Okay, so what does WebAssembly mean for JavaScript developers? I mean, you're at a web dev uh, user group, like, so why is someone talking about you know, C and C++ and stuff like that? Well, the first thing to remember is WebAssembly is not meant to be a replacement for JavaScript. Now, there are some implementations of WebAssembly that treat it like that, the way um, uh, runtimes like Golang and uh, .NET through Blazor uh, and things like that. Like they are kind of typing in this, this whole, like you build the UI in like Golang or in 
net and then you like you just build this application fully in that uh, ecosystem because that's what you know maybe you're more familiar with and you're more comfortable with uh, and then we'll make it run in the browser uh, but fundamentally things like the dom aren't available to this WebAssembly uh, virtual machine because it is a fully separate virtual machine running inside of your JavaScript runtime and like it wouldn't make sense to have access to the DOM if you're running in like a node runtime where you can still run WebAssembly because it's just running inside of your JavaScript environment, not inside of a browser. And JavaScript is actually pretty good for a lot of scenarios. Like the fact that it is a dynamic language has a lot of like highly useful aspects to it. So thinking of WebAssembly is, oh, now I've got to kind of throw away all the stuff that I've learned over however many years I've been do doing web dev because I've got to write everything in WebAssembly is, is not correct. There's definitely use cases for it. And we'll get to those use cases in a moment. But first off, I'll start with some of the terminology. I've been throwing around things that are kind of WebAssembly centric. So I just want to make sure that we all kind of understand what I mean when I'm talking about those. So first off, uh, we've got the module. This is your WebAssembly binary. It's the thing that's going to run as a WebAssembly application. Uh, from a like a code standpoint, that's the module directive that uh, or the, the module keyword that was the very first line of code of the very first slides that we saw. Uh, and we'll use that then as the, uh, that's the kind of, yeah, the, the thing that is our application. And from our module, we then create an instance. Now an instance is a running virtual machine. This is a fully sandbox VM running with inside of a JavaScript runtime. It is using a WebAssembly binary as the, um, the creation point for that VM. Now you can actually create multiple VMs from the same WebAssembly binary. Not quite sure why you'd want to, but you can. So there's that. We then have memory. Now, the, because we, we're controlling this VM that we're starting up, uh, we need to tell it things like, you know, how much memory have you got available? As, like, is it just the entire memory of your computer? You probably don't want to give it like 16 gig. That doesn't seem logical. And, and you know, the way that the browsers tend to work is that um, memory is not something that you really can control with inside of your application. It's just, it's available. You just consume it and you write however poor you want your code and it'll just get bigger and bigger and eventually you'll uh, run out of memory on your machine or you'll crash your browser. But in um, WebAssembly, we create uh, essentially an array buffer um, and that is owned by the JavaScript runtime. So the thing that's hosting your uh, VM, your running WebAssembly instance, and it's actually shared across boundaries. So you can write to it in JavaScript and read from it in WebAssembly and vice versa. But memory can only store values, strings, numbers, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and then you have to control the position of them. Uh, again, we, at the start, we saw we, we set the, um, a position zero and we wrote to that. And then we had to say, read from position zero and then read how many um, characters, how, how many bytes out of that memory that you want. So then we have um, another thing called table. The table is it's similar to the way uh, memory works, but instead it's for function references. So let's say that I wanted to dynamically add a function to the uh, virtual machine that's running. Uh, well, I can do that. I, I would create a table, I'd pass the table in, and then I would um, add a basically a pointer to that function to the table, and then it's available inside of WebAssembly. You can then share that table, uh, and then you can um, do the inverse, like expose a function back out of the WebAssembly VM to our running table, uh, sorry, running um, host. Uh, you could even, like if you had multiple WebAssembly instances inside of your application, you can actually share the memory and the table between them so they can read and write from each other, you know, pass data back and forth. Okay, cool. Why? I still haven't got to that why thing. One of the key reasons is sandboxing. Now, you might have an, uh, something inside of your application that you need to have a bit more um, control over. You want to isolate it from just like the random running ad scripts that are on your page or if someone like you, you've got like uh, Google tracking codes or you know, whatever other um, analytics tools. Do you really need access to the cryptography um, uh, code that you've got in your application? Yeah, maybe not. So you can sandbox that inside of a VM. And because that um, running WebAssembly instance is fully isolated and only knows what you explicitly give it, you can't just have that boundary crossed, um, which is something that's really difficult to do in JavaScript alone. Maybe we want to share some stuff between client and server. Like you're implementing a client in uh, in .NET and you want to be able to share code back and forth, like share the, the, the schema between your uh, API endpoints. So, whatever so you can do like proper code sharing no, and not just like isomorphic javascript as we've been trying to do over uh, over the last number of years but if your backend is not javascript you can do it with other languages 
maybe you've got something kind of complex that you need to do in your application. You're wanting to manipulate images, um, like do crops and resizes. You can actually reuse that same code client and server. Literally just compile down the same binaries and then execute them. Uh, no need to look for a JavaScript implementation of your favorite um, you know, image manipulation library. You can just do that with like the, the original one written in C. Or maybe you're doing something that is relying on complex mathematics or um, complex number processing. You know, this is kind of like that game space. Uh, you're, you're building an application um, that is like heavily relying on 3D graphics. You know, we all know the fun that is JavaScript number system, um, but using uh, maybe a language that's better optimized for dealing with those kinds of problems, vectors and um, ray tracing, et cetera, like maybe it's better to do it that way and, and just palm that off to another application format and another language. All right, so what does it take to build an application with uh, WebAssembly? Uh, the first thing you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to pick uh, whatever language that you want to use. Um, for me, um, like there, there's plenty out there, um, like C, C++, like, I keep harking on about those, like that's where it was really de designed around. But you got languages like Rust, um, which is, uh, something I have absolutely no knowledge on uh, other than you, know, you should use it over you know, C and C++. Or you know, maybe you're a .NET person, like that's where my background is. You can run in like C Sharp or F Sharp and compile that down to a WebAssembly binary. You can write the WebAssembly text format if you so want to write something that is somewhere between the brainchild of Lisp and assembly. Um, not sure why you'd want that, but you can. <laughs> Uh, maybe you could use Golang. Um, I'm actually going to use Golang for the demos that we're going to uh, break into shortly. Uh, and there's another one that uh, I came across recently called Assembly Script, which is actually, it's like a, a variation on TypeScript. So strongly typed JavaScript. Um, anyway, uh, but then it compiles down to a WebAssembly binary rather than to JavaScript. So that could actually be a way that you could leverage a bit more of the JavaScript skill set, but the potential performance optimizations you can get out of WebAssembly. So um, I, like I said, I, I, I've got a Golang application here and we're gonna jump over and have a look at that. If I can find the right tab, there we go. And I'm gonna make sure that I've got the right thing shared. Yes, I do, fantastic. So I've written a little Golang app here. Um, now, if you're not a Golang developer, by all means, I'm not trying to convert you into one. Um, this is probably the most Golang I've ever written. And there's only about a hundred lines across this whole project. But what, I, what it's doing here is it's going to a uh, Git repo that has a list of, um, well, actually, let me just open this file up here. So this is a markdown file that has a list of events that um, uh, like when, they were, when they're on, wh what state they're in and stuff like that. Uh, if we were to maybe come to this at just uh, github.com, github.com and have a look at that rather than uh, try to like parse Markdown, Whoop. there we go, and then we'll do that. Um, and it gives it like this nice table format and we can see all the events that we could attend before lockdown and then we're depressingly not gonna be able to attend. And then we can go back over like previous years and be depressed like here's, here's how we used to do events in person and get very sad. Anyway, um, so uh, I wrote a little thing that I, cause I, I while I can read the markdown or I can look at the table, I wanted to be able to just do like filtering, like get rid of all the events that aren't in my state or things that are past and stuff like that. So I wrote a little bit of uh, a markdown parser um, using just a, a Golang markdown library I found on GitHub. Um, what it's gonna do is it's going to walk through that. It's then going to parse the syntax tree of markdown um, using the understood format and then ultimately drop it out as a bit of JSON. So if we were to come into source, uh, uh, actually, let's go into bash. I'm in the wrong shell. Yeah, we go source, markdown tools, and then app. And we'll do go, go build app dot go. And then, okay, so if I was to then run app, oops, dot slash app, let me just pop that up. And I realized I forgot to increase the font size of that. So we'll just zoom in. Uh, as we can see, it's it's giving us um, a JSON file uh, or JSON output. And that's pretty useful. Like I can, I can pass this to like JQ. I can then um, write a little JQ query against it so that I can inspect that, um, you know, like do those performance filtering and like all that sort of stuff that I 
kind of would want and need. Now, that's all well and good. Uh, and now I'm like way too zoomed in. View, zoom, no, zoom, reset. Or is that? No, that's browser zoom. Control zero. There we go. Let's just jump back to our slides. Where's the slides? Okay, so how do we compile this? Well, Webpack seems the logical answer because like we've got some Golang code that we need to compile to run in WebAssembly. So compile being the, the key thing there. Now, look, if, you, if you're using some other um, preprocessor, then cool beans, you work out how to plug it in. Um, Webpack's kind of my go-to. Uh, that's the one that I tend to, uh, tend to play with. And then I'm thinking, well, we got to think about how we're doing this as a modern web developer, which means that I'm going to have to find some massively overcomplicated browser framework that I can use for this. So I went with React. Apologies to anyone that's a React developer out there. Um, I am a React developer myself. Like that's that's where I go. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, how could we make this uh, work? Like how could I essentially run the core of my application not in JavaScript, but then use it from JavaScript? Okay, so let's go back to the browser and have a look at how we can do all of this together. So we're going to close off our little bit of JSON here. Sorry, a little bit of uh, application here. And we're going to open up app.tsx. Actually, before I do that, I am just going to come, come back to the root um, source. No, uh, npm start. We'll just run npm start in the background and we'll come back to it. So this is, um, I ran create React app and it scaffolded me up an application. Um, and then I decided to you know, use things like React hooks and so on and so forth. So I have you know, browser router and all that kind of fun stuff and a couple of custom hooks. But this component is, oh, it's also written in TypeScript because I just wanted to like see how much of a challenge I could really throw myself by uh, uh, putting it into um, like a, a strongly typed language that's dealing with another strongly typed language, which is then dealing with WebAssembly. Yeah, got to got to over complex thing, complicate things as much as you can. Now I have a hook here that's called use years, which is the years to the different uh, markdown files on the uh, GitHub repository. Uh, and then that's just got the URL root. So that's an array. We'll have a look at the hook in a moment. We'll come back and yeah, it's just it's fairly standard React application. We've got some divs and nav. We've got our router. Uh, it's got a menu across the top. It's got like a loading check, routes defined, so on and so forth. React router, all that lovely stuff. Alrighty. So let's have a look at maybe this use years hook because that's probably a bit interesting. All right. So we're coming into here. It's a custom hook. It's got some state. Um, so you state the years and it's array and then whether or not we're loading. And that's got an effect, which is just going to do a, a promise.all download um, all of those things. Uh, when they're all done, we're just going to update the, um, the years, but using this download years function. Okay, let's dig into that. It's coming from fetchevents.ts. Cool, uh, so there's an interesting line at the top that we'll come back to. Have a look at download years. It's JavaScript async function. It's using dev events, parse markdown. Oh, so obviously we're doing a fetch. So I figured, well, we've got to get the markdown, right? Like we've got to get that raw text. Browsers are pretty efficient at downloading files. So maybe we should just use fetch for that rather than our Golang app. Because if we have a look at our, the way our Golang app, it uses this thing called HTTP.get. So HTTP being a Golang module, get to download a file. And then we pass it across to markdown tools, parse markdown as a string. Yeah, we could probably do that in JavaScript. Like I said, the browser is pretty efficient in downloading files. Cool. So we'll download that as text and then we'll call a thing called parse markdown. Uh, because it's uh, um, as TypeScript, I'm just strongly typing. So it's string input, string output. So we pass that in. JSON parse the response. And then we should be able to map that out to JSON in the browser. But what's this dev events .parse markdown? Well, that's that you know, interesting line I called your attention to it and then told you to ignore as we skipped over. Uh, it's importing a file called devevents.go. So up until now, we've just been importing .ts files because uh, TypeScript. Now we're actually importing a Golang file. Click through to that. Oops, let's not click through to that because that's the TypeScript definition that's for it. Uh, it is here, devevents.go. Well, okay, so we're importing a thing called markdown tools from the folder markdown tools which will, um, if you know anything about the way Golang works, it will be importing this file here, which is the same file that we've been using from app.go. So the, the console application, so this is the same file. We're just importing it into a file that's being used in the browser. 
Then we're using uh, a little bit of uh, magic that I've written. Uh, it's a Webpack, um, a bit of interrupt between uh, Webpack and the way that we output uh, a WebAssembly binary. And that's just a thing called GoBridge. And then we create a function called pass markdown. It's going to receive a value, which is um, some JavaScript. That's the this context and then some arguments. Uh, in, case we're in, in this case, we're only really getting one argument. Uh, we're unpacking that argument as a string. We're calling markdown tools, pass markdown. We then get that back and then convert that into a, um, uh, it comes back as bytes. Um, that's the way that uh, Go deals with parsing markdown, uh, sorry, parsing JSON, turns into bytes, so we turn into a string and send that back out. And then on the Go bridge, we're originally a callback called pass markdown, which is the function that we actually execute from our JavaScript, which means that then that comes available here through the Webpack um, plugin that I've written. So in our Webpack config, I have just said, anytime you find a, uh, a test go, uh, sorry, test for file extensions dot go, we're going to use the Golang Wasm async loader, which is the one that I've written. And that should then just parse that, uh, handle that Golang application. Cool, looks like our dev server is up and running. Let me grab the link to that. Did it not actually start? Or did I not expose ports? Oh, I think I forgot to expose ports. That's going to be very disappointing. We'll see. Uh, I'm running in VS code spaces or uh, GitHub code spaces, sorry. Uh, and I set up a, a specific dev environment for this one. And uh, it, so it runs a, its own Docker file. And I, th oh, I don't actually have to explicitly expose the port from the Docker file. Fantastic. Ta-da, look at that, magic. Um, now, if we just come over and have a look at our network. I'll reload again. So we can just see what's happening here. I only do with the XHR uh, that's coming in. So we'll see that it's downloaded dev events.webassembly, which is a WebAssembly binary, which is not going to show anything in the preview because it's a binary file. Um, we can see that it comes down there. Uh, then we have a whole bunch of uh, calls out to GitHub uh, and downloading these readme files. Let me just, sorry, zoom that in. because I know that's really, really, whoa, that's got crazy. There we go. So we've got some markdown files there. Uh, and then if I scroll down, yeah, there's some more markdown files. And, whoops, back out of that. Uh, this is then getting passed off through, whoa, I'm like clicking the wrong button everywhere. This then is then handed over to our WebAssembly application. Uh, it's available here. I can have a look at it. It's going to be lovely and decompiled as uh, WebAssembly. So I probably shouldn't have clicked that. It's probably going to kill my browser. <laughs> uh, but then this comes back then, like, like I said, it comes back from WebAssembly. Let's, there, oh, actually, there we go. There is the WebAssembly text format. If you ever were curious about that, I do not know how many lines of code there is. So I'm going to close that one because what I actually wanted to do was find the, where's the file that would have been served? Ah, oh, it's inside a bundle. That's it. Uh, I don't have source maps turned on. That's disappointing. Oh, well, um, the way it would have come together if we could have seen that is that it comes back to fetch events, uh, it comes back as JSON, then this is exposed by fetch events as an object, which is then available up into our custom hook called use years, which is going to then set it on state. That's right, I can look at it from, yeah, components. We can have a look at our app. It has state, which is used years, which has got that, which is the arrays, and that's all of the different years that are here. And now this is just JavaScript. Like I can do sort and filter. Uh, is there anything happening in Queensland? No, there's not. Last year, here's all the events that were happening in Queensland in 2019. Let's get rid of that filter. Um, I could then say, let's have a look at 2018 and look at web. Here we go. Here's events that were tagged as web. And this is then like, well, now we're just doing all of this client side. So we've passed off the complex part of our application. The thing that might be, it might take a long time or it might be computationally expensive to do to our WebAssembly application. It's running in that VM elsewhere. Uh, and um, it, it's, it's not running in the JavaScript threads. Uh, so we have less chance of UI blocking. Let's go back to our slides and we'll just kind of wrap up. A little bit, uh, where am I? There I am, next slide. Okay, so just to kind of wrap things up, um, like WebAssembly, it's it's here, 
like it's a thing that's available for application you're building. Uh, it's useful if you want to like sandbox part of your application from like a security side uh, standpoint, or there's just maybe you know IP sensitivity. You want to try and hide some stuff in there. Um, you know anything that's shipped on the web, you can decompile, but it's going to be a lot harder to decompile a uh, WebAssembly binary than it is to just um, uh, decompile obfuscated JavaScript. You could reuse stuff between client and server uh, if you're doing non. JavaScript servers, so if they're you know, Python or .NET or Go, I think I've seen PHP and Java, Rust, you know, et cetera, you can compile those and use that same code in both places. Because some languages are better for certain workloads than others. You know, we might love JavaScript, but there's some things that it is just not as optimized for as other languages out there. Um, so let's look at how we can leverage them uh, in applications that we're building. If you want to learn more, um, check out this uh, aka.ms short link. Uh, I wrote a multi-part uh, blog series about my experience learning WebAssembly, and we kind of go from setting up a environment uh, to do GoLang WebAssembly all the way through to uh, deploying it into, uh, like basically building that application that I was just showing there. Uh, and then WebAssembly.org is the uh, website for WebAssembly, and is where you'll find obviously more information. Um, be aware that the uh, code bases that I go through in that blog series, uh, it's about 18 months old. So it's using not the latest version of Golang. It's using Golang 1.12, 1.14 is the latest. And there have been some changes in the way that they use WebAssembly. So um, you'll just need to be aware that the, the versions um, might have evolved a little. And that, uh, if you use the latest version of Go, it, um, that tutorial won't be 100% accurate. But it will, uh, if you use a older version, it will get you there. Uh, I'll also um, share the link to the uh, code demo that I used tonight um, as well for anyone that wants to play around with that. But thank you for having me. Um, I will be hanging around for the rest of the event. Uh, so if there are questions, et cetera, excellent. Uh, and this is where you can find me online. Uh, but again, thank you for having me. I hope that's been interesting. And I hope to, that you now got a bit of interest in trying out WebAssembly. I think we do. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, there are a bunch of questions. I'll uh, run through them now. Cool. Uh, I'll so, do my best to answer them. Uh, well, I, I'm sure you will. <laughs> uh, so if I just look over here on this other other screen, uh, are ASM.js apps still supported if WebAssembly now is the new method? I guess that's um, from the start of your talk. So the short answer is yes, because um, ASM.js is, it's just JavaScript. Um, it doesn't do anything that isn't valid JavaScript. Like you could write ASM.js by hand as plain old JavaScript. Um, what some of the JavaScript runtimes did was optimize for it. So they um, so they did uh, the pre-optimizations based on what the, the spec of ASM.js said. I don't know if the runtimes are still maintaining that um, or whether it's something that they're deprioritizing and looking to remove. For that, I look into like the V8 backlog or the um, spider monkeys. I think that's the one that's in Firefox. Um, or JavaScript core uh, from a Safari standpoint. Like, yeah, I, so I'd have a look specifically at those ones if you're targeting them. Um, but the long and the short is that, yeah, you can still run it. It might not be as fast as it used to be, uh, but then computers have got faster, so maybe that cancels out. Awesome. Uh, do compiled binaries and the like still have access to networking, even if they're sandboxed, or do they rely on JS to pass in that kind of traffic? Uh, so... The anything you compile into the the binary is available for it. Like so, it can do like outbound network requests. Um, but in terms of like stuff getting passed into it, it's only what you explicitly allow in. So yeah, um, it can it can call out of the sandbox, but it's whether or not you can call into the sandbox. That's kind of more of where the boundary lies. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, there's two more. Uh, are there any benefits besides obfuscation of compiling a JavaScript application to WebAssembly? Um, probably not. I, I, maybe you're going to get it a little bit faster, but be aware that a WebAssembly application is going to be quite large. I think that the Hello World Golang is it's a couple of meg. Um, I, I think that one that I was just demoing there is like five or six meg, and there is less than 100 lines of going in it. So you're going to sacrifice a lot of performance on the initial payloads that you're downloading. Uh, maybe if you're building like an Electron application where you're less concerned about that, sure, but I wouldn't be converting all of my JavaScript code to run in WebAssembly um, because the, the value of that is probably fairly low. 
Cool. So there's a bunch of runtime code then that ends up getting compiled in. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. So that's that's host code. Yeah. So that's, that's something to be aware of. Um, so something like Golang or .NET, um, and I would expect Python um, and PHP and things like that, which are runtimes. So they're, they're still kind of using an intermediate language. Those runtimes will have to be shipped down to run the application. Languages like C and C++ and Rust, which don't really have a runtime, um, they will compile to a much smaller application. I think the, I think like the Hello World Rust is, we're talking bytes, whereas the Hello World Golang, we're talking megabytes. Ooh. So that's, yeah, that's something definitely to be aware of. Mm, yeah, important consideration. Uh, is WebAssembly supported just in the browser? Is there any support planned for Node.js? Yes, there is. Um, I haven't been following along for kind of the last six or 10 months on the um, node side of things, but I mean, because V8 supports it, it's supported. Um, when I first wrote this talk and, and the, the demo for it, I, like, I actually do have the ability to run that same code base in node. Um, I've seen stuff that node were trying to work on how to better support it just doing like a straight import for a WebAssembly binary. Um, my hope is that the long term we can get rid of the way that you do current compiled binaries for node applications and ship them as WebAssembly binaries, not ship them as like using um, node GYP because that thing is just painful. Mm -hmm. I've never had yeah. that work successfully on Windows. Um, so yeah, I, I know it's something that's definitely on the cards for, for them because um, I've seen them talk about it. I can't remember exactly where they're at for it, but I would be surprised if it's not something that is um, that's supported behind a flag at the very least. That's fantastic. All right, thanks again. That's the end of our questions. All right, thanks. Uh, anything else, um, keep popping them in or ping me on Twitter as well. Absolutely, yeah, we'll keep the lines open and I'll keep reading them out. Uh, thank you very much. Virtual applause from all of the uh, people we have uh, currently watching the stream. Uh, cool. I will uh, now invite Ashley Davis to uh, jump up on the uh, unmute button and uh, we'll get hey. him streaming. There he is. How are you doing, Ashley? Hey, I'm good. All right. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Davis. Uh, I'm the CTO of Sortal. And we're a business that's uh, helping companies uh, manage their digital assets with machine learning. I've also written a book called Data Wrangling with JavaScript. And that was my first book. And my second book is about to be published as well. So that, that's called Bootstrapping Microservices. Um, so if you're looking to get into microservices and you know, th this book is a very practical project-based guide for doing that. And it's got examples in JavaScript and Node.js. So this talk isn't about that, but I'm gonna have a link at the end uh, for anyone who's interested in learning microservices. <clears throat> um, hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, some pretty difficult times at the moment with this um, awful pandemic. Um, I'm so grateful, Kevin, that you're continuing to um, keep Quiz Jazz running. It's, it's such a valuable thing to have. And uh, also thanks, uh, Aaron. That was a really interesting talk on uh, WebAssembly and uh, I'm looking forward. I've got some motivation now to kind of look a bit deeper into that and, and see what I can find. Yeah, I'm going to share screen now just so you can see what I'm looking at. <clears throat> Hopefully everyone can see that. <clears throat> so this phrase, uh, to reinvent the wheel, um, just for anyone who hasn't heard it before, I'll just give a, a, a brief explanation. It, it means to rebuild something that has already been built before. And the connotation is that reinventing something um, it, like, is pointless um, and it's a waste of time. You know, somebody's already done it before, why are you doing it again? So in general, this is um, a warning, a good warning. Um, and you should be really, really careful where you invest your time and your focus. So in this talk, I want to explore a little bit about when it's okay to reinvent the wheel. And I'm going to show you my new open source project called Minikul. So just a bit of background first, um, to make a long story short, I really like GraphQL. Um, I think it's pretty awesome, but it didn't really fit my needs. So a few weeks back, um, after many months of thinking about it, a few weeks back, I actually set out to create my own uh, query language, and that's what I've called Minikul. It's, it's pretty much like GraphQL, it's just a lot smaller. Now I had some good reasons for doing this, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. 
and I can assure you it's not it's not just because I'm crazy. I, I'm a little bit crazy, so there is that. Um, but it but it is small. It's tiny. It's uh, you know I, I implemented the core query engine in TypeScript in a very short amount of time. <clears throat> And I've actually put a lot more effort so far into examples and documentation than I have for the code. So that sort of explains how small it is and, um, and, and it's quite abstract and, and that's, it's quite difficult to explain. And, and that's why it's kind of a bit of an investment actually getting examples working and to get documentation around it. <clears throat> so after all this experience, the last few weeks of putting this together, I just wanted to talk a little bit about it, um, tell you why I did it, um, give you a bit of a demo and, um, just give you a brief look at the code. We're not going to have we're not going to have time to look at too much code. <clears throat> so first of all, um, if you haven't heard of it yet, a little bit about GraphQL. Uh, these are the facts at a glance. GraphQL is a language to query and manipulate data. It's very popular. Uh, it's created by Facebook. Uh, it's open source. There's a link on the slide there in case you want to learn uh, more about GraphQL, and I'll and I'll, re I'll repeat this link on the last slide as well. So um, if, if you thought that I didn't like GraphQL, you, you're quite wrong. I mean, I, I think it's actually quite incredible. And I wanted to use GraphQL so much um, that I decided to lovingly rewrite the parts of it that work best for me. So why didn't I use GraphQL? Well, there's definitely a time and a place for GraphQL. Uh, I've seen it work really well uh, when I was contracting last year. Uh, but I tried to implement it this year for my, for my startup and it just didn't fit. Now, the first problem was having to have a schema. So, you know, I, I run a startup and we need to rapidly evolve and iterate our product so we can experiment and we can find the best possible product for our customers. So one of my aims um, in this effort is to it's sort of an ongoing effort really to reduce the cost of experimentation. And, and not using a schema um, really helps with that because the cost of defining a schema uh, and updating it as the data evolves, when you, when you don't really know where the data is gonna go yet and all the database migrations that you normally need for like you know, traditional data schemas, you know, that's just a headache that I don't need and I don't want. <clears throat> And also it's a microservices application that I'm working on. So I don't want to have a schema for every microservice. So when it, when it came time to put this massive schema together, I would just, I just have to say no to GraphQL, unfortunately, because it, you know, it is really good and there's a lot there that's really useful. Now there's some other issues as well. So um, GraphQL adds an extra language. It's got its own query language. And I didn't want to add that extra complexity to our stack. I mean. It, all things considered, it's not a big deal. It's not a big issue, but you know, given the choice not to add a new language to our tech, I'd, I'd prefer not to. Also, um, GraphQL is quite big and complicated. It takes time to learn. It takes time to implement. Uh, you know, another thing I didn't like about GraphQL is I just I found it really tedious that you have to ask for all the data you want. Now I know that's a performance thing that you only get back the set of data that you that you really care about. But I really want to just to be able to get all data back, you know, by default, and then to have it optimized as well as an option. But by default, I want to be able to explore my data. I want to be able to see everything that's there. <clears throat> so for me uh, and my startup, the barrier to entry for GraphQL was too high. And that really got me thinking about uh, what it would take to recreate it in some minimal form. <clears throat> and this leads to the most important question in the talk. And that's when is it okay to reinvent the wheel? We're often told that reinventing wheels is a bad thing. You know, some people say that we should never do that. You know, generally it's a good principle. It keeps you out of trouble, keeps you wasting your time. But consider this, if no one ever reinvented anything, we'd never have better things. We'd be stuck using the same tired old programming languages, databases, operating systems, that sort of thing. So there are times when reinventing the wheel is necessary for like innovation and, and evolution and sometimes revolution. But unfortunately, we only ever really see that in hindsight. So um, when you make a better wheel and it's successful, you're gonna be praised for that. You're gonna 
have people you know, heaping praise on you. But the only way to get to that success is to make it past anyone who's telling you that you shouldn't be reinventing wheels. Another reason is that the existing wheel uh, doesn't do what you want. So you, you need to make something that does work the way you need it to work. That's, this is exactly what happened to me. So, you know, GraphQL didn't fit my needs. And so I had to create my own small query language. You could also be mo motivated to build a better wheel. Um, I, I personally, I don't think I could, I could build something that's better than GraphQL. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so that's not really my motivation. But if you think you could reinvent something and surpass the limitations of what came before, well, that's the motivation for reinventing the wheel. And of course, it's perfectly okay to uh, reinvent things for fun or education. And this is actually a really great way to learn as a developer and, and get a lot more experience. You know, so pick some technology that you really like and try to make your own version. You know, you, you probably find along the way that it's really hard and you can't actually do it because it's just, it's just too much work for one person or it's going to take too long. But that's perfectly okay as well. I think it's perfectly okay if you're a hobbyist programmer or, or doing programming on the side of your day job that, you know, that you get into a project and as soon as the value runs out, you just drop it, just get rid of it. You know, if you've had some fun, if you've learned something, it was worth it, you know, move on, it's okay. But um, just, just don't do this on work time. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're at work trying to invent, reinvent GraphQL, I work for myself, so it's all good. But um, if you're working uh, in, a, in a traditional development job, just be careful when you do this, because it might not look too good for you. <clears throat> so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my new open source project, Minikul. It's a tiny JSON-based query language inspired by GraphQL. And obviously this was born out of the desire for me to use GraphQL, uh, but, but not being able to use it because of my circumstances. Minikul is uh, implemented in TypeScript, um, but it's compiled to JavaScript, so you can use it from any JavaScript or TypeScript um, code. The query language, of course, is just JSON. So it's possible in the future that you might see Minikul implementations in other languages other than TypeScript. Like there's no reason why this couldn't be implemented in you know, Python or Java or Ruby or Go or whatever. Um, so Minikul doesn't force you to define a schema. Um, I'll talk about schemas again just in a moment, but, but by default, you don't have to provide any kind of schema. And all the fields of your data set are returned by default. One of the things that was really important for me for, for Minikul was keeping it small. Uh, and, and, and because of that, many features are delegated to the back end. So whatever uh, database you happen to be using in the back end, um, you can make use of its special features like the search, query, pagination, anything like that. That kind of works like GraphQL, where it delegates a lot of the work to the back end. Um, so you can customize that however you like. My first, implement, my first implementation of Minikul works in both Node.js and the browser. And uh, I'm about to show you some examples. <coughs> so I might just zoom in a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't change this too much. Uh, what I'm showing you now is something I just sort of prepared over the last few days. It's the Minikul interactive example. So this is an example that runs completely in browser using the, the Minikul core engine and also the Minikul inline add-on, which basically allows you to query against uh, data that you've got in memory. Um, this has got a really cool um, Star Wars data set that I downloaded from Kaggle. You can see down the bottom here, there's the data explorer. You can just hide that and show it if you want to. But this is where you can browse among uh, Star Wars characters, species, and planets. There's a bit of a search option here. I already typed um, Darth Vader's name in there. So I'm just going to search for him. So you can see that there's data, some data here for Darth Vader. <clears throat> okay, so now what we have on the left here basically is a bunch of sample queries. In the middle is the query editor. This is actually using uh, Monaco editor that you find in Visual Studio Code. And it's using a, uh, this is where I said I'd talk about schemas because in, in this front end, I've actually using a JSON schema so that 
if you type the wrong thing here, so if I type something here that's not supported, it gives me a little error. So that, that is actually a schema, but it's not, it's not something that's built into Minikul. It's just something that's built into the editor here. So on the right here, we've got the query result. So I can run this query. Of course, it's already been run. Uh, and you can see we've pulled out of our spreadsheet, out of our CSV file, some data here on Darth Vader, some statistics about him, uh, the planet he comes from, Tatooine, and his species, which is human. <clears throat> now there's a bunch of other queries here. So what this query is doing is I'm saying, get me a character entity of name Darth Vader. So that's how that's working. I'm gonna open up the second query here. So this one's very similar, get me Darth Vader, but I wanna resolve this time a sub entity. So we're gonna get Darth Vader's homeworld. So I'm just gonna run this query. And you can see here, we, we've still got Darth Vader, uh, but it's expanded his homeworld now so that we've actually got data on his homeworld. So if we look back in the data explorer for a moment, you can see that the, uh, that, um, that data about uh, Tatooine has basically come from that separate table there. Now there's a bunch of other um, sort of queries here you can run. We're gonna be running out of time. So I won't go in too far into these. You can, I'll, I'll put a link to this example on the last slide if you wanna have a play with it yourself. There's an example here of a, a third nested um, query where it basically gets Darth Vader's homeworld and then it pulls the complete set of characters that come from that homeworld. Actually, I'll just run that because it's pretty cool. So you can see down here now we've got 10 characters. We've got Luke Skywalker, C-3PO, Darth Vader, and so on. Now, there's a few other things you can do, like, you know, we're, we're getting a single species here, Jabba the Hutt species. Um, this query, because it has no arguments here, it's gonna get all species into an array. And this one here is a nested, uh, another nested query that gets all species and also drills down to get their home worlds. So this example is um, based on re using React. Uh, Plain JavaScript, this, is, this isn't built in times, TypeScript, but it is using the Minikul TypeScript library. <clears throat> I'm using Ant Design for the UI here and Tailwind. And uh, I'll just show you the GitHub page. So it's on GitHub. Um, if you wanna have a go at running this example yourself, it's really simple. Just grab the code, npm install, npm start, and you'll have an example that looks like this. <clears throat> I'll show you the actual uh, Minikul organization. So I've made an org for, Minikul on, on GitHub. So you can see there's a whole bunch of projects here that I've started. Um, it is a work in progress. Um, I'm pretty happy with the core engine, but all the examples and the add-on modules uh, still have a bit of work to be done. This is the Minikul repo itself. So you can see at the top here, there's a bunch of different examples. An example of using Minikul with CSV files, using it with JSON files. Um, there's a JavaScript notebook here. I'll show you that in a second. Um, there's an example here of using it behind a REST API with Express and wrapping a MongoDB database. So a more complicated example there. Uh, now, uh, there's more work to be done on the documentation here, but there's plenty of examples to have a look at uh, if you're interested. Let's just have a quick look at the code. So this is the, uh, it's, it's all in one file. It, it's pretty small. It, I mean, it started off uh, probably just a, a handful of lines of code and it's grown to almost 400 lines of code. But I mean, as far as things go, that's not, uh, that's not that big really. So if you are interested in kind of understanding how a project, a TypeScript project like this comes together, um, have a look through this. Um, the code, some of the code is pretty ab abstract but uh, it was built using test-driven development. So if you actually look at the commits, here's the commit history. This is the first commit. So it, it, I started this basically from my TypeScript template, which is uh, a project that I share on GitHub. I'll give you a link to that on the last slide. That's how I start any new TypeScript project. It's just a minimal kind of TypeScript project. And then from there, the whole, um, the whole thing was built basically through, you know, writing tests, making the tests pass, all the way, all the way to the end. So if you're really interested to see how a project like this evolves using TypeScript, test-driven development, you, you can go into any of these commits, basically. Um, there's a good one. Let's have a look at this one. So you can go into any of these commits. Um, you can see how the code changed. 
And you can see the test that was added. So here's a test that was added, a test that we could retrieve multiple nested entities using the core engine. So there's a lot of stuff to look at there. I'm a little bit over time already. I just want to show you the, uh, the example notebook. So this is a notebook that I published from DataForge Notebook. Um, it starts just by loading some data and then doing a bit of a preview on it. <clears throat> and then we're doing some configuration here of Minikule CSV. So that's a module that basically integrates CSV files and, and you use this, this data structure here to kind of say how they relate to each other. And then you can run queries against that. So these are, these are like the queries that we looked at in the interactive example. There's a query here that gets all species and the example of the JavaScript code to run that query and then the result you get from it. And you know you can go through this whole notebook here and there's plenty of other queries to look at. You can get to this, uh, you can get to all this stuff from the Minikul um, repo, which is the first link at the end. So it just starts with all these examples. So I think I'm basically done. Um, <clears throat> I'll just leave you with a few resources to end up. Um, the first one is the link to Minikule GitHub, the, the repo with all the examples links in it. The next link is the interactive example. If you want to have a look at that, have a play with it or we'll get it running for yourself. And then there's a link to GraphQL if you want to learn more about GraphQL. There's a link to my TypeScript template. So this is how I start any new TypeScript project. It's really small, really minimal, um, pretty easy to understand what's happening there. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's a link to my, my new book, Bootstrapping Microservices. So I've finished the first draft. I'm currently working through revisions, but already it's, it's available uh, on the early access program. So you can buy it. There is still time for you to give feedback as well if you want to influence uh, the direction of this book and where it's going. Uh, and, uh, and that's all I've got for the moment. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Ashley. That's amazing. Uh, cool. All right, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one being, can I apply mini QL in places where I'm using GraphQL right now? Um, cool. Sorry, let's move for a second. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing. Okay. Uh, it's early days for, for mini QL, uh, and, it, and it may not cover, it, it probably doesn't cover all GraphQL cases. Um, so it's like hard to know really uh, without having like a specific scenario, but um, uh, please reach out to me on Twitter, send me a message on Twitter, Ashley Davis 75 on Twitter. Um, you know, tell me more about how you want to use it and how you're using GraphQL. And maybe that can help kind of steer this in a direction as well, because I, I haven't done that much work with GraphQL, just sort of briefly worked with it last year. Uh, just enough really to know that, you know, I. I I needed something like that to simplify all the hundreds and hundreds of endpoints that I've got uh, in my application. So that, that was one of my primary reasons for, for, for wanting to have GraphQL in the first place. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's still a work in progress. Um, I just, it'd be good to know a specific situation and I, I could tell you how, how it might work in that situation. Cool. Uh, the next question is, uh, what are all the data sources supported at this time? And is that running in a query server? Uh, so it, the, the core engine is just, just pure JavaScript. There's no servers, no nothing. So you can run this thing entirely in a browser like what I showed with that interactive example. And what that was doing is I'm basically just loading, because um, uh, it's all pre-compiled through, um, through the React scripts, I can just require in JSON files. So that's my data. My data is just inline JSON compiled into my application. And then I've got a module called Minikule inline. So that's a separate module that you can install that basically just takes a JavaScript object that has sub objects that are the entities. Um, so it just, it just basically wires it all up so that you can use Minikule to query against inline data. So that's, that's in browser usage. Um, what's most interesting to me is um, accessing it through a, a REST API. And, and that's really just a case of, um, there's an example of that in there as well that you can find using Express and MongoDB. Um, and so that is the front end making a HTTP post request and the body of the post request is your query. And then you have like one REST API using Express or whatever like on, in the back end that's then handling that request and plugging the query into Minikule. Um, but we've, we've basically wrapped our MongoDB database in a, in a Minikule resolver. So it's like, it's like an adapter lab that basically communicates to your data source. 
So you, you can you can have any data source you want, any database, um, theoretically. Um, I've only tried it with MongoDB, of course. Um, but I do have modules up there that work with um, CSV files uh, and JSON files. So that, that was sort of like my bootstrapping process. So I, it was going to be easier to kind of um, get a, make a nice demo um, out of CSV and JSON files than it would be out of MongoDB, which is, you know, it's a lot more work to make an application that has MongoDB in the back end, although I've done that as well now. So there's a whole bunch of different ways you can use it and different examples that show you different ways to use it. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for applause. <laughs> Thank you again, mate. Um, Okie dokie. Uh, we're going to jump straight into our next speaker's uh, talk uh, on Gatsby and Strapi. Camillo, are you there? Hey, hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll let you have the floor. Okay. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Camilo Vitrago. I'm a software engineer from Colombia. And today, okay, this is my social networks, if you want to see her. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about Gatsby and Strapi. In the next uh, half hour, I'm going to try to create a small web app uh, using Gatsby and create one integration with the CMS Strapi, okay? But first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about theory. Okay, what's a Strapi? Strapi is a CMS headless. What does that mean? Before some CMS, you have all the, all the interface or every integration that you need to do was in the front. Now, this CMS offer you some REST API or GraphQL endpoint which is make it easier to integrate. And also you can integrate with different languages like Angular, React, Java, everyone. Okay. Some features that we have about the Strapi is first is open source and also is created under Node.js and offer some kind of plugins. For example, GraphQL is one plugin. We are going to use this web application with GraphQL and JWT authentication, which make it easier for a uh, modify if you decide to modify and do something in the back in the, uh, for the backend. Okay, what do you need to install Strapi? Uh, really, you need Node.js uh, and you can run in Windows, you want to Mac OS or in using Docker. And also uh, you can create different Strapi environments using MongoDB, MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, or SQLite. By default, when you use the main command that is create the query star, you are going to create use SQLite. Okay, to create a single Strapi app, you just need to use a small command. In this case, I'm going to create one. Already, because they sometimes take Time, but yes, just let's execute this command to create our first jar application. Oh, sorry, I'm going to create a jar. We have it. If you don't use the quick star, you can choose between different database. In this case, I use SQLite by default because I'm now going to to integrate or make some modification to the database. It's going to take some time. Uh, until that, we are going to talk about a little bit about CASP. Okay, what's Gatsby? Gatsby is a site generator based on React.js. Uh, really, they use React.js, GraphQL, Script 6, and CSS. And the main feature of Gatsby really is the highest speed of the website because every website that you create there is rendered in, in one HTML and 
every render is a static web, web app, which makes it really easy with some extra integration, for example, for managed image from different, different tools. Then some benefits of uh, Gatsby, as I say, speed is the main future. Security, because Gatsby, when you create a static uh, website, you are not going every time to the backend to get the information. Uh, then that make you, uh, that really is going to improve the security here. Also the low cost, because you are not going to go to the backend, go to the database each time. And the scalability, because you can use uh, every component of React.js, okay? Uh, Gatsby, in this case, they have their own sale AI. And just to install and create Gatsby new, the name of the site that you need. Okay, let's go to create our Gatsby site. Okay, our our Strapi app is not re is not ready, but I deployed one before, but for a question of time. And now this is how you see every information. And let's go to let's go to deploy our Grasby Strapi app. Sorry. Okay, while well, this is loading, uh, what we are going to create, I'm going to create a, a small app uh, with some projects, for example, one project with Node.js, or even if, for example, you want to create your personal page and you want to add your projects in there, you have that, uh, you have that in the CMS, and also you can, after sharing a Strapi, create the integration. Okay, the first page that you have here is create a strap authentication. Okay, a strap work with content types. The really is going to be kind of data tables that we are going to use. By default, they have the roles and permission on the users. If you, for example, want to show to the user and allow to the user to get some information for the content types, you they can need authorization and we are going to configure it later. Okay, we're going to create our first collection type. We're going to call projects. Here we have different kind of data. For example, text data. We have the name, if you want short, long text, and some specific feature, for example, if you want a default value or you want a, as a private, a private required. Okay, let's create a new one. For example, you want the description. And we are going to create one extra for the image. Say, uh, so. moment, let's check. Okay, we have our projects here, and let's create three projects very, really quick. For example, we have our Node.js project. Let's create tomorrow.
Also, if you want to configure it here, how do you want to display the information when you are creating, you can modify here. But really, I prefer not to use preload. They don't offer just control the order of the, in the input. And let's go to create one more for Gatsby. Okay, we are ready. Next, th next thing that we need to do is go to roles and permission. Uh, we have two possibilities, authenticate or public. Uh, for example, we are going to allow that everyone can access to our projects. Now you can see here, we are going to enable our projects. When you save, Let's check. Okay, ready. We, we have already our API with all the information because it's public. But we are going to install GraphQL uh, because we are going to integrate Gatsby with GraphQL. In this case, we are going to go to the marketplace and install GraphQL. This takes time between the load and after install. Uh, we are going to or be working with Gatsby. Okay, Gatsby is ready. Holding. Okay, Gatsby, you can see in the page. Let me check one second. Gatsby offer different plugins, or oh, don't know what, that you can use. In this case, we are going to check for our strapi. There are, for example, for Spotify, um, different source. In this case, we are going to use Gatsby Source Strapi, but I prefer to use Jarn, personal election. Uh, we just need to make a small configuration for how our integration is here in the Gatsby config. We are going to add one resolver. Some options. In this case, we need the API URL. And the content type that we choose. In this case, we are going to select that. We are going to go with projects. We don't have access to that line. As a public, they are not going to throw an error, an error. okay? Finish yet?
Let's wait a little bit while we finish our installation. This was here. Okay, ready. We have installed our Gatsby Strapi. Let's check who is working. Our Strapi app. Here we can see in our Strapi app, um, everything is okay. You can see our GraphQL. Oh, it's not working yet. We can install our GraphQL. Sorry, maybe I forgot to do the correct installation. Okay, now, while our installation is running, we're going to create our integration with Gatsby, with Strapi, sorry. We're going to create an, a hook to get all our projects. We're doing for on Casby. Well, GraphQL and use a static. Use a static query. And we are going to add a function. Just for integrate to add our user static query, we're going to add a constant. Check when this is working. You know, this is a lower strap. For some reason. Okay, already installed. Yes, we have our GraphQL installed. You can see all the documentation here. For example, for the projects, all the details, the ID, the name, the description, the image that you have. Let's check who is working. In this moment, our GraphQL for Strapi is working. Let's check who is working, if that is working also in now in our Gatsby app. Okay, let me check the config. Because I am having one error.
Okay, our error is here that is not reading our result. Yeah, it's just a typo on resolve. You yeah. Got, uh, it's ah, sorry, yes. Yeah. Yes. No yes. worries. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, at the moment, this is not a problem. Okay, let's check if everything is working. We are going to see our GraphQL. But this time, wrong Gatsby. And yes, perfect. We have our Strapi projects here. And we have all the projects in here. Now, this query we are going to use for our GraphQL. Let's check what is our result. This is our main page of Gatsby, but let's check. No, and we have a lot. We have a lot, which you see. Okay, let's spread it. Okay, here we have all our information inside the inside of Gatsby. Our next step is create simulation. A recap, because of time, of our projects. I'm going to create a map. Here oh, we have our result. We are going to return 
So notes. This one just project the name. Okay, we have ready our components uh, from Strapi now but in Capsule. I have one small CSS here. Give me a second. One of the advantage of Gatsby is, for example, the management of image uh, here with our creation by default. We have Gatsby image. Also, when we create our, our query with GraphQL, we can use something that the name is sharp. And we cr can create a fluid that allow us to manage the image in different size. For, for that, we are going to create a chart. We are going to create a chart, a child image chart, and we are going to create a fluid. Okay? Just need here have an integration. And now we are going to use one image here. With a fluid. Our project. Image sharp fluid. And we are going to add our classes to our this. Going to create one div extra as a container. Okay, this is the problem is that they have one already that with the name image in there. A check. Okay, the problem is here. OK. 
Okay, let me check because um, you're not taking our chart. I think it just doesn't like the the new line. There's a space between on line 16. Sorry, in which part? Yeah, that one. If you get rid of that, I think it likes it more. Oh no, okay. <laughs> Ignore me. <laughs> yes. Give me a second. Let's check. I think that we we mix one. Yeah. That works out. They're not loading the. Okay. Yes. Sorry <laughs> for the errors, but yes, the idea is we have the sharps now, and we have the full integration between Gatsby and Strapi. Also, if you want to deploy, just with a common. Okay, one advantage of this uh, of Gatsby is that when you create a deploy, you can deploy just the front end. In this case, we don't need to deploy the Strapi app. We can just deploy our Gatsby app and we are going to have all our page, uh, our page working. One second. Okay, we just need to add our application. We have one folder that is public. We just need to put that here. We already did. Wait a little bit. And we are going to have our app deploy in a server. In this case, if you want to add like more information, you need to redeploy or we use DevOps to create a continued integration to upload all the all the chains in, in your app. But in this case, they take everything, everything that you have uh, already in Strapi and use for create the static type. And the performance really, when you check, for example, with the Google tester is really good compared with different site generators. And that's it. Sorry for one or two errors that I have, but yes, it's, this is the integration between Gatsby and Strapi. Um, yes, that's it right by now. Thank you. I don't know, questions? Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, that was awesome. That's uh, a thorough introduction on how to get bootstrapped uh, with all of the tools. Um, so yeah, we do have a few questions there. Uh, the first one was, uh, have you used other headless CMSs like Contentful, Netlify CMS? Uh, if so, do you like Strapi more for any particular reason? Um, really, I have used a Strapi, like in this case, but also I use that CMS, which is really good. And the integration is quite similar. They just offer you uh, your GraphQL and you integrate. And yes, but in this case, it's, it's up to you. The good about Netlify CMS, for example, is that it's good for the continued integration. Mm -hmm. If you decide to use Netlify instead of, for example, Strap. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and the fact that you could take your whole app bundle and put it on Netfl Netlify anyway gives you a lot of transportability there. So that was really impressive, actually. Uh, we have another one on here. Uh, why is an image called a sharp? Okay, okay. Really, I didn't call sharp. Uh, Gatsby by default have offered one plugin. Okay, when we use the Quag Star, they install one NPM package that is sharp. Uh, they allow you to upload and show the image. For example, if you see in some cases, this image take a little more to render, 
but the performance on all the page you can see without problem. That means that uh, you are going to render and the performance is going to be better, but the image sometimes take a little more, but you, the rest of the useful of the page is already done. That is why I use that and just show the image. That is one advantage that Gatsby offered to, to develop. Mm, cool. Uh, in your presentation, are you running Strapi locally? Yes, yes, yes. I create everything locally. And also, you, if you want, you can create, for example, one using one database like MySQL in a remote. But also, here you can use locally because when you create the building and you deploy the app, uh, you use everything that you have there. Then you don't need to really install the Strapi in one server. You use the information and the database and the integration that you already have in your local and just deploy the guts we have. Yep. Makes sense. Uh, is the continuous in integration something that you can one click install? Really, I haven't used uh, yet a continuous integration here. I know that, for example, if you deploy Netlify with Netlify CMS, is a little yeah, easier. I, I think they were talking about the Netlify side of things. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think that's all of them. Thanks so much. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks to all our speakers. That was a fantastic, very informative night, jam-packed full of information. So uh, thank you, everyone at home, for, uh, for your attention and, and, uh, and listening so patiently. Um, cool. I'm just going to get into my closing remarks. Thank you again, Camilo. Thank you so much. Okay. Cool. Uh, there's a bit of a pause there all the time when I throw up the uh, slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, uh, I'll just check that you've got video on. Yeah, that should be fine. You should be seeing me as well. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone. Uh, that was uh, that was great. Uh, it's, it's awesome to be able to do uh, a couple of half hour back to back talks there as well, um, and uh, and some regular sized ones there as well. So we've uh, yeah we've obviously went went through a great deal of content tonight. So. Um, uh, thanks very much, everyone, for, for preparing such awesome, awesome talks. And it's great to have Camilo um, uh, come in this month. I know we were trying to get him there for last month to have the great Gatsby night, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't going to work. We we couldn't get everyone to um, to appear at once. Uh, so it's all good. We uh, we make sure that we can get everyone around. Um, there's uh, some info on the screen there about uh, uh, how to get in touch. Uh, there's brisjs.com and the app brisjs Twitter. Um, you can still uh, go find that Slido if you've uh, missed out and you haven't, for example, put in uh, an entry into the Wallaby, J uh, Wallaby JS license. Uh, please do that. We've had a few successful ones in there. Uh, I'll be drawing a winner uh, from uh, random. There was no winner last month. We didn't get the right answer. Uh, so um, let's see if I can't uh, actually do a double feature this month and uh, we'll pick two winners. Uh, we'll, and uh, I'll be in touch with those folks and uh, we'll make sure that your license can get sent out to you. Um, thank you very much for everyone who's participating. I'm going to leave that poll up um, for the rest of the evening. Uh, if you've got any feedback, any ideas, uh, you know, that you'd like to share, uh, happy to hear them. Please get in touch with me if you like. Um, my, uh, my inbox is always open and my Twitter DMs are always open. Uh, feel free to uh, hit me up. Um, as, and I, and I mean, the, the BrizJS social is, is, is there for you. Um, please do uh, contribute some talks for next month. Uh, we'd love to see you um, bring your unique perspective to our, uh, our community, um, get that presentation going. Uh, I know there's a bunch of folks doing tough right now around Australia as we've got this uh, sort of second wave of COVID going on. So please do stay safe. Uh, please make sure you observe all your... Uh, all your COVID safe measures, social distancing, staying inside, all those good things. Um, make sure we look after each other. And um, 
we'll we'll see you online. We'll uh, we'll keep we'll keep together as a community there, and uh, I'll uh, I'll share out some links uh, to some of the resources that our presenters have put up on the uh, GitHub issues that they already have there as well. Um, so thanks everyone for your attention, and uh, yeah, stay in touch. Uh, I'll hope to see your um, your contributions for next month's talks. Uh, see you later, everyone. Bye. Hello. <laughs>